Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, this is uh, deliberately an international uh, panel. Uh, and so we've reached out to uh, not only an international panel set of members, but also an international audience. My name is Julian Salaberry. I'm the CEO and the founder of Galen Growth. Galen Growth is the um, world's leader in digital health, private market, uh, data analytics and uh, intelligence. And it is my great pleasure to host today uh, a panel uh, for esteemed uh, members of our jury for the tournament. Uh, and of course, to, to host uh, all of our audience as they join uh, one by one. Um, the focus today is, as was advertised, really revealing the secrets to picking 2021's most promising digital health startups uh, award, um, but also, of course, to announce the winners, uh, which is, um, I guess, the suspense we've been building uh, over the last few weeks. Uh, a quick bit of logistics as people do join. First of all, this is being recorded uh, because uh, we really certainly have learned the last couple of years of pandemic and therefore virtual webinars that a lot of people who register uh, actually wait to see the recording uh, afterwards rather than joining live. Although we do have some live participants and we hope to get more because it'd be nice to get some questions from our audience. Regarding questions, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screens. This is for the audience. And I strongly recommend you use the Q&A to manifest your question. So at least I know it's a question as opposed to a comment in the chat. Uh, and of course, uh, we will leverage these questions and ask them to our jury. Uh, today is a 60 minutes. Uh, we will be really talking to the panel for 45 minutes uh, and hopefully allocating some time to audience Q&A. Um, and of course, uh, we will then switch to announcing the winners, uh, inviting uh, one of our winners certainly to join us and to share a little bit more about what he uh, and his startup are doing. So our panel is a subset of the jury. Uh, we had 10 esteemed members um, really drawn from the uh, digital health investor, influencer uh, and business leaders community. Um, we thought that a panel of 10 people was rather unwieldy, so we really focused on four. Uh, so today I have with me Ritesh Patel, who's senior partner at Global Digital Health at Finn Partners. There's a gentleman in the white shirt. Uh, he has very kindly given us the first hour of his Thanksgiving uh, to participate uh, in this debate and share with us uh, his words of wisdom. Uh, Ritesh is a uh, well known to all of those who are following uh, any digital health hashtag on Twitter, among other places. Uh, Stefan Kurt, uh, VP of International Convertech, um, a digital health um, a corporate, uh, which is definitely dipping its big toe and other big toes uh, into digital health. Uh, Amit Kakar, senior partner at Nova Holdings, uh, joining us from India. Sorry, Stefan is joining us from Paris. And uh, finally, but not least, Agnes uh, Delia Snyder, uh, who is a CEO at Future for Care, uh, a very new uh, consortium established by some leading players in um, uh, digital health as well as their respective industries. So welcome and uh, thank you for taking the time to join us today. Our panel synopsis is, I, I'm going to give a bit of context using that. And the context is really important, I think, because correct me if I'm wrong, um, panel members, but digital health really is probably about 10 years old. Uh, and so what we've seen in the last two years of pandemic has been an acceleration of the adoption of technology within healthcare and, of course, a disruption of expectations within healthcare of all the stakeholders uh, that sit in healthcare. So I think it's fair to say that we've clearly passed the tipping point of digital health now. And so um, it's, it's really important to start looking at digital health not as a fad, not as a fashion, but more as a core driver of change in healthcare. If you to look at the context from perspective of the level of innovation going on, in Western Europe alone, we count at Galen Growth, and this is all Galen Growth data, a couple of thousand ventures. And since 2016, we've seen a CAGA, a combined annual growth rate of new ventures of about 10%. Um, this particular ecosystem, the Western European one, has attracted about 15 to $16 billion of, US, uh, of venture funding across about 2,200 deals, which is an average deal size of about 7 million US dollars. Comparing that to the US, which Ritesh will know very well, um, there are roughly speaking, and it's, you know, we're not that it, that determining these numbers has been absolutely accurate simply because ventures die and ventures are born every day. 
but roughly speaking, two and a half thousand ventures, uh, digital health dedicated in the US, growing at an annual, sorry, combined annual growth rate of about 7%. Um, those have attracted about $110 billion US uh, of VC funding. And I mean funding here. So I'm excluding all the exit deals, just funding. Yeah. Uh, and that's been deployed over 5,400 deals. So as you can see the dwarfing already. Uh, and you can see those in the uh, global numbers anyway, when it comes to um, total funding this year. Um, and then, of course, to give you a great bit of contrast in terms of Asia, where Amit is sitting, um, approximately about 2,600 ventures, combined annual growth rate of about 6%, has attracted about $37 billion of, of VC funding across about 3,800 deals. Uh, so it's an interesting set of uh, a contrast for you there. Um, Back to the tournament then. So, so, so those numbers really give us a good flavor of just the maturity of the ecosystem and how it's growing. And, and of course, um, contrary to the initial thoughts in 2020, as the world started locking down, um, there was a slight deceleration in investor um, investments in digital health. And suddenly it picked up again and has it broke records in 2020 versus 2019 and 2021 will break those records all over again. So it's in very good health. So every year we at Galen Growth um, host a tournament um, where we um, select 64 ventures from our data, uh, where we focus on Series A and earlier stage ventures only. That's why we call them promising because of stuff that's in growth stage and late stages tend, tends to be more obviously proven. Uh, and we try to ensure, of course, the whole globe is represented. And then we move forward in terms of um, selecting a winner. Now, in the past, we've usually given that role to what we call the Health Tech Tribe, essentially our subscribers and followers at Galen Growth and now allow them to vote. It's what we generally call the popular vote. Now, that has happened anyway, and that's one of our winners today. But this year, we felt that it would make a great deal of sense to also have a jury of 10 um, leaders in the space to actually look at the data and bring about what we hope is less of a popular vote, but more of a thought out, evaluated approach to, uh, to, to, to the, the 64 contestants. So what I want to do today with these, the subset of the jury really, is to explore and discuss how you've looked at those 64, which we literally were from all over the world, and literally were focused on different bits of the value chain in digital health, as well as, of course, um, at, uh, you know, different levels of achievements. Uh, and, and, and so what we did as Galen Growth is provide the jury members was a compendium of data on all 64 and then allow every jury member to take their own time and make their own decisions as to which one they, uh, they uh, were voting for and allowed to move to the next stage. So. Um, What's exciting for me is to be able to then spend some time with the jury members and understand a bit more the process they went through each time I send an email to them saying, hey, it's time to vote. And um, and, and so I'm very keen to, to, to understand that better. So um, I'm going to start with a few questions uh, and hopefully we'll get some audience questions through that we can uh, we can then include as well. Um, let me start with you, Ritesh, um, largely because I think I've known you the longest of the four uh, jury members. Um, why is digital health important to you in your profession? You know, it's a passion as well as a profession. I started following this thing called digital health, as you rightly suggested. It's about 10 years old, but, you know, you noticed that when the consumer guys about 2016 started to really take off the Fitbits of this world, tracking people started tracking their steps and things like that. There was a noticeable education level that occurred around people now saying aha i can do something about my health and that's where i got this from which was you know if you give people data or information rather than scare them or yell at them they may do something different so it really started to become a passion of mine back then in looking at well what benefits will these things provide but more importantly, because I work in the US market, which is huge, completely fragmented, and as the pandemic has shown over the last couple of years, fairly broken in some areas, what can we use these technologies for to really provide care to folks that need it in a way that would be beneficial? So while it was consumer grade at the time, a um, couple of things that really 
blew my mind were the ability to collect data from these things. And I was working for Inventive at the time, which was a CRO. And my job was as the head of digital for that CRO. And the biggest thing I was trying to digitize was getting rid of the fax machines to collect endpoint data, <laughs> right? So all of a sudden, Spark, you know, wow, we could actually use these things for things like real world evidence or remote trials, right? Uh, we had tried to pioneer the remote trial stuff. We'd acquired a company called MyTrust that did e-consent at the time, um, that sort of thing. So that's really where it started. And I think it's it's grown substantially and rightly so because the planets are lining up. Technology is becoming more ubiquitous, right? Access to AI wasn't available back in 2016. I can spin up an AI instance on Amazon now without a data scientist if I wanted to. Uh, access to cheaper grade stuff that can work in components. Um, and then finally, the, the security and privacy of the cloud has really made it possible. So I think those are all the things that sort of drove me but um, into this uh, and why it's a passion of mine. And now we work with clients, right? How do we innovate? So most of my work is either for health systems or pharma companies where I work with them around, can we do this? And what can we do to innovate either uh, a product or a service or a capability? Uh, the fight still continues. We work with a client who had a really good digital therapeutic created. We got it, got it going. And then the pill guys came along and said, hang on a minute, you can't launch that. It does the same thing the pill does. So it's a beyond the pill service. It's not a standalone. So we're still going through some of those issues. Uh, but a lot of my health system clients that I work with um, really, really are embracing this and saying, how can we change the model? How can we change the delivery of care? Remote, hospital at home, things like that. Fantastic. Thanks for that yep. broad walkthrough. But it's, it's, it's very interesting to see how you're seeing it professionally as well as personally. Uh, Mick, let me switch to you. So with your investor head on, uh, why is digital health important to you as you look at healthcare and your, you know, I guess your healthcare investment strategy? No, look, uh, firstly, uh, you know, I, I'm absolutely in sync with what Ritesh said. And again, for me, it's a personal and a professional journey. So I'll actually challenge the, the digital health part to not just being 10 years old, but I actually had the first uh, touch with data analytics about more than 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And in that avatar, it was known more as the computer-aided diagnostics. I'm talking about early 2000s when we, we tried to run uh, some image analysis in Stanford on MRI images, looking at you know, ligament tear and you know, breast, breast nodules. Uh, the only problem was the computational power wasn't there and it took us about two weeks on a Sun Ultra Spark system to get any kind of data analysis. But the mm -hmm. spark was there to Ritesh's point. And, and I think fast forward uh, now 10 years, uh, I think the event of uh, telehealth or telemedicine was one of the first things that started emerging. Uh, and, and I think at that point, it was more to address a unmet need uh, in a way, uh, because in, in the part of the world I'm in, it's always been a fairly skewed doctor versus patient ratio. And the fact that the specialists especially used to concentrate in bigger cities, and it was always a challenge for patients from tier two, tier three cities, to get access to really, really top-notch specialists in different areas, whether it be cardiology, oncology, or some of the other emerging disease streams as things move from infectious diseases to more chronic diseases. Uh, and the initial phase was actually a, a bit of a disaster uh, because you would put up these large monitors, uh, the bandwidth wasn't there, the internet wasn't that, uh, you know, prophylic at that time. And the other thing was, that the patients actually did not want to talk to a doctor over a screen and they wanted to see the doctor in person because that was more personalized, that was more a touch point, even though the doctor would hardly spend more than five minutes with them and they would probably in some cases travel hundreds of kilometers uh, to come and see this doctor. Sure. Mm -hmm. So that one point, actually, I think uh, the infliction happened during COVID. Uh, I think there was no uh, you know, solution for these patients to rely on a remote telehealth kind of a solution to sort of make that connect. Now, uh, a lot, a big question now for us is what happens post COVID? Will that stay? Will that go? Or will there be some kind of a stickiness and the rest will go? So I think to address your question, what excited us most was 
the unmet, unmet need and the access to healthcare. I think these are the two things which were very, very evident. And I think these are the two needs which will continue to drive the stickiness of a lot of people to use one part of digital health, which is telehealth or telemedicine. But for us, I think it goes beyond that. I think telemedicine was the precursor, but what it is leading to is other aspects of digital health. I think Ritesh alluded to the fact where you now have to have access to healthcare outside the hospital, outside the clinics at home. And that's where technology, IOTs are coming into play. That's why virtual healthcare or step-down care at the comfort of your home for patients with, let's say, diseases like COPD, congestive heart failure, can be managed at home effectively without being inside the hospital and freeing up those beds for the other patients. And I think the third aspect for this is the AI, the AI, you know, really, really infusing both technology in the world of diagnostics, but also I would say accelerating drug discovery. So, you know, helping taking drugs from a earlier stage into more clinical stage because the data has always been there. It's now the effort to take that data and actually make sense of that data yeah, yeah, and yeah. put it into clinical use. So, so from our perspective, these are all the various exciting aspects of uh, investments. Uh, mm -hmm. And because we are long-term patient capital deployers uh, across the different life cycle of investments, we don't shy away of looking at a venture stage opportunity to a growth. And of course, we haven't reached the large stage in some of the most of the cases in this part of the world in Asia. But I think we see that line of sight of digital health being transformed through these various aspects between now where we start seeing investments pouring in, but more patient investors in this field over the period of the next five to 10 years time frame. Yeah, no, I mean, it's interesting to see that you're looking at the whole value chain when you're looking at yeah. digital health or through the lens of digital health. So continue to look at the value chain. Stefan, let me switch to you. Um, as you look at your value chain and you look at digital health, you know, I saw you nodding when Amit was saying we're definitely past a tipping point. It's now, it's, it's clearly now accelerated through COVID. So, so looking at it through the lens of, of Convertec and, and, and your role of, uh, of making patients' lives better, you know, how's digital health now become that much more important to, uh, to you and Convertec? I think we have different points to take into account. The first one, uh, which is very, let's say, uh, practical uh, somehow. That's what so Amit raised before about access to the HCP and the way we interact today with more and more remote activities and where we can bring something else out of what we can do face to face. I think there is a clear acceleration and this is where as a company, so we need to adjust uh, the model we have and the way we interact with the HCP and also hospital. But I think the key point is much more the fact that this pandemic situation also has been a huge accelerator for a lot of things. Um, uh, as a company, I think that obviously we are not anymore as a medtech company, uh, only focused on the product. And we know that as value, as a value proposition, if we want to make some difference and being uh, disruptive, we need to build some capabilities behind where we don't look at the patient for the single you know, solution, obviously we can offer, but more, much more a broader aspect. Uh, and this is where I think that the, also the omni-channel approach is very interesting with uh, health digital. So in the patient journey, being able to track all the different pain points, uh, unmet needs, and have the capability as an organization with all the department to have the right answer to the right message at the right time with the right support. I think it's, it's really something that in terms of approach is really a big change. And the value proposition is moving from a single, let's say product solution to a much more wider with some empathy a solution where I think that can make some very big difference. So think patient first, just try to understand exactly his journey, where he is, and digital is the um, best vehicle we can use for helping him. Excellent. Thanks for that, Stefan. So, and yes, back to you, and I deliberately left you at the end simply because I wanted to, you know, trot, trot through the other case stakeholders because you as a CEO of Future for Care are wanting to be that catalyst of these various stakeholders to drive the, uh, shape the agenda, uh, the debate, but also drive the momentum in digital health in Europe. So, so, so 
yeah, I guess why to some extent it's almost stealing a little bit from uh, from uh, the, uh, a panel, uh, a future panel. But uh, you know, when you as you work with your consortium partners, why is digital health therefore uh, so important to to them, but also of course therefore to you? Yeah, thank you, Julien. Um, if there would be just one thing to say, I think it's important because we are all convinced that digital health can save lives. And uh, this, to, just to say that is very new because uh, mm. before that we were just fearing uh, the manipulation uh, of health data, of uh, digital and data. And, um, you know, just uh, to answer you also personally, I was working uh, 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 10 years with Vivendi uh, in the entertainment uh, sphere, then 10 years with Orange. Uh, so I've seen all this part of our lives getting digital, um, sometimes with, uh, with way to, to go to there, which were just crazy when you think about it. Uh, I mean, if you look at how music went from digital, physical to digital, it was a kind of a weird way, but we did it at the end. Mm -hmm. And um, with that experience, I, I was uh, absolutely convinced that health will follow the same path and that we will have uh, trial and errors. Uh, we will have fears, but we will manage to really find use cases, find uh, UX that are easy to use for patients, for uh, medical professionals, and that will really help the medicine to be accessible for everyone. And that I think is very important. Uh, is if you think about it, there is 50% of the planet that do not have access to proper care. It's mm -hmm. how can we, you know, live with that? How can we have everyone in the planet having, we have more smartphones on the planet than people living on the earth, but mm -hmm. we have 50% of the, of the planet that do not have access to proper care. And this cannot stay like that. And uh, with Orange, I was working a lot with Africa. Uh, there is one cardiologist in Cameroon. In a country like Cameroon, there is one single guy that is cardiologist. And if you think about it, you can have people that deliver um, the, 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 um, the care, and then you have a, you know, a professional that analyze the data, a cardiologist in India, a cardiologist in France. In, in the UK that help the access to a better medicine to everyone. And that's really what drives me. Um, and that uh, really makes me wake, wake up in the morning and, uh, and be here with Future for Care to uh, try and have big groups, big industrials, people from the uh, public sphere and startups getting together and try to uh, to have digital health as accessible as digital music for everyone um, as soon as possible, because you're saying we are accelerating, but uh, I think we're still running late and uh, it's time to accelerate. Cool. No, you're absolutely right. I don't think any of us would disagree with you. Um, so let's switch gears. Let's, let's consider, therefore, the 64 contestants that were um, selected. Um, some of them unbeknown to being the, to them that they were selected, but selected purely using uh, the data that Gale and Growth has, has built over a new number of years. So, Amit, I'm going to switch to you first, if I may. Um, so, 64, essentially 64 names were thrown at you, uh, including a compendium was a few, a few, um, uh, I don't know, hundreds of pages, certainly quite a few pages in the compendium. So, how did you start then? 64 is, is quite a lot. Uh, so how did you, how did you, what was the initial approach you took to try and, um, I, I guess, triage, so you ended up focusing on the ones you really wanted to focus on? Oh, you, you've thrown me a tough one, Julian. I was going to take uh -huh. some pointers from the other guys, so of I course, can use we their will. words. <laughs> but, <laughs> By the way, I mean, to just be very careful, because I think if I'm a startup on this call, I'm now writing everything down that you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's my concern. Uh, look, look. Firstly, I would say that it's it was just not the sheer number, but the but the quality of a lot of these companies, which was absolutely fantastic. You know, I, I really wish I was thirty years younger, and not for other reasons, but really, really looking at this, you know, great access to technology that's coming through. And look, a lot of that, I I actually I know people blame COVID a lot for a lot of things that have happened, and for the right reasons. 
But I think one thing that COVID has really, really done well for us is accelerated innovation. Uh, you know, and it's really shown, uh, you know, necessity is truly the mother of invention. And I've seen that pipeline getting more and more robust and validated over a period of time. So look, it was a tough one uh, when you get thrown in and inundated with such good quality company. So, so there are a few things that I, I looked at as a first cup or as a first mm -hmm. draft. Mm -hmm. And again, back to my investment thesis was, you know, which are the companies which are really, really taking care of the unmet need out there? Which are the companies which are providing areas like access, uh, affordability to healthcare, changing the paradigm in managing various aspects of healthcare that we were doing through brick and mortar or through heavy you know, physical presence into more efficient and digitized way. And there were some common things that emerged. And I think you probably all of us saw that. Uh, there was a very heavy focus on AI, as you, as you saw, across various fields, whether it was yep. uh, in you know, trauma variation and oncology in different areas and dermatology. And, and that theme started to emerge in some of the bulwark of where digital health is heading towards. So I think looking at some of these common themes, I sort of pointed out four key themes in digital health. And look, by all means, these are not the only things in digital health, but no. these are the four themes that I've been looking at and I've been assessing, which I believe are making a big paradigm shift in the way healthcare is being delivered. And actually I had to wear Julian, my physician hat, which I haven't mm -hmm. practiced for a long time, <laughs> but the, the fundamentals are still there of really as a physician, what are some of these tools, techniques, innovations, platforms that would help me as a physician, you know, address those unmet needs and help my patients or take the pain points away with some of my patients from an access standpoint of view. So that was my sort of first cut in demarcating uh, some of these companies and I started looking through or going through them in picking up the winners as we went across the process. So so I, I think I'll leave it at that at this stage because I'm sure there would be other questions as we talk about picking up the finalists and what sort of made the cut decision for me. But I think just to address that first point for you, this is the demarcation factor that I used in picking up some of the early stage winners and some of the companies that fell off the scene. No, oh, it makes perfect sense. And certainly looking forward to understanding you know, I guess what the next steps look like for you as you got a bit more granular. Um, Ritesh, um, really keen to see how your very US flavored eye, I guess, looked at 64 contestants that were only a small proportion from the US. And therefore, how did you go about getting that list down to a manageable size? It's the same process. You know, I think I come across so many here in the US, as you rightly say, because of the market size as well. Um, there were there were companies that I went through, which I've got about five others here in the US doing the same thing mm -hmm. uh, at a variety of stages of growth. Either they've already been funded, or they already got companies or customers, that sort of thing. So the process was, OK, what do they have? What's the offering? Do I know? And is there other are there other players in the market, particularly here in the US? And where are they compared to mm -hmm. where these guys are? Uh, also looking at the team. Uh, I did a lot of work in just going through and looking at who are the people, what's the experience behind the founders and the team that's behind this? How big are they and where are they in the cycle? Have they just gone to seed? Have they gone to you know series A? Where are they in that process going forward? And then the last thing is, is that product something that's going to be useful in the market that a business model could be built around? Because mm -hmm. a lot of the startups I talk to and I work with have a fantastic idea of a problem that they believe needs to be solved in the world, but there's no business model behind it. So yeah. you can raise a lot of money around it, but if there's no business model, you're not going to get that far. Uh, unless you go become a 5013C not-for-profit for some reason, right? So so those are all the criteria I went through. And some of them were fairly easy because, you know, this, I think if you look at looked at the criteria, if you looked at the list, you know, mental health, yeah, there's a ton of people doing that at the moment. And some are doing really, really well, right? Oh, a yeah. couple of exits, et cetera. A uh, huge amount around clinical trial recruitment and matching patients, there's here in the US, there's about 50 companies that are doing that now. Some, some of them are doing, including Verily, you know, the biggest oh, on the good. planet. So who has access to enormous data. So those are some of the thinking that, that went through in selecting the people that I selected. That's interesting because I think team, I mean, I suspect all four of you will say team is massively important. Massive. And, and, 
and yeah. an enormous drive in your decision. Uh, and, and we're looking at that quite closely at Gaiden Growth, where we're not looking at team from an academic qualification perspective, largely because in healthcare, they all end up pretty much in the same place. So, you know, you can more or less guarantee that in digital health, the entrepreneurs or founders tend to be highly qualified. So you need to look at other uh, trends in terms of achievements. Um, which is you can always, having. Julian, you can always get, you know, getting a chief medical officer or an advisory board of very qualified people, you can do that fairly quickly. So it's sure. not only the team, the core team or the founder or the person who's come up with the idea and is, is sort of bringing it forward. But who are those advisors that are part of that in equation as well? It's very critical and important. No, you, yeah, you're right. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Stefan, let me switch to you then. So uh, I'm assuming your head was really pretty driven by looking at it through the lens of, uh, of, of you know, I, I drive a major business unit in, in Convertech and therefore, you know, how would this particular venture be a potential valuable partner? Uh, I may be wrong, but that's kind of the assumption I'm making here. So I'm keen to see how, therefore, how does that influence your triage to get to, a, to a, I guess, a, a, a manageable list? No, to, to be real honest, I try to be more agnostic first. Okay. <laughs> uh, and with, um, I try to be driven with a kind of common sense approach. So not too much academical to your point uh, before. Mm. Uh, so for me, what I tried to look at was some criteria such as, okay, um, first as a solution on the offer to what has been said before. So is how disruptive is it versus what we can get uh, um, for the moment. So first, that's the level of disruption. Second is much more about, okay, what's the population are we are talking about? How big is that in terms of impact? I think it's something that also is absolutely relevant not to really focus on something which is on a niche. So that's... Uh, what kind of problem we can solve and to what kind of, let's say, uh, level. I think that's two things that are, for me are, are really important. Um, and something also at the end, which is much more linked to the efficiency that's the medical benefit we can foresee. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's really at the end, what will make the, the, the real difference. Uh, because if we have to build a model behind a cost-effective model, whatever, that's something also that we bring value to this, uh, to the startup itself. So that's more or less what I try to look at uh, with the knowledge I had. Um, and I had sometimes, yes, to look at also uh, the people, because at the end, I, I think we all all in agreement here. You can have a lot of, let's say, great ideas with fantastic uh, different uh, proposals, but I mean, if you want a team to be successful, you need to be sure that uh, behind the, the leader who can be an engineer, very strong in, uh, in scientists or something like that, do they have the structure and depending on where they are in the cycle or so, are they ready to move to a much more commercial, uh, let's say, area where it's, it's another skill so, so that you need. So the team behind is still very important as well to consider. So that's something I looked at the end, but much more as a sanity check. Okay. I'll come back to one point you made in a minute. Uh, let me switch to Agnes. Agnes, I left you last again, largely because I know based on your uh, regular LinkedIn traffic that Future for Care has been doing its own cohort selection in the past week. In fact, yesterday, I think was your, your big uh, ultimate final vote to, to select your first cohort. Um, so how much, so, so I guess what I come back to when I look at accelerators and cohorts and selection is that really the quality of what comes into your cohort is a huge influencer and determinant of the quality of what will come out the other side of the accelerator. So how, how did you look at that shit, 64 and how do I get this down to a manageable list? Yeah, well, um, I really agree with all, with all what has been said. Uh, when I was looking at all this, I mean, it's fantastic selection. First, I was struck by the diversity of his initiatives but my obsession was really um, in assessing uh, what is our way to market because I think the really the difficulty will be when they will be at this tipping point where they go to market and that's where either they succeed or not I mean 
may sound very basic what I'm saying here, but when you're talking about digital health, where you are mixing the difficulties of the digital and the health, you have all the burden of regulation, clinical trials, and all the agility of the tech parts of this business. And if you, and back to my example with music or games, if you, mm -hmm. You have a, a you want to pull out a go to market with a, with a video game, then you just have your end user being the beta tester. You cannot do that with a healthcare product, you know. So you're mixing, you know, these this two aspects are going as fast as possible because you're in the tech industry, but you cannot be in an error and trial uh, and testing uh, process as. It is often the case in the digital. So I think this question of the go to market uh, and with uh, both the scientific uh, proof of concepts and the UX, so that really at the end it will be in the ends of passions or professionals, that's really key. Mm -hmm. uh, then I cannot agree more with the importance of the team. Uh, here again, the same as. A, what I just said is how do you mix competencies from the medical and the, the, the tech sphere? It's mm -hmm. key. Um, there are a lot of projects that comes from the scientific or research uh, uh, world and that miss of business partners. And that's really, I think, where uh, accelerator like us, Future for Care, can help. Can help find talents, uh, hire people to uh, find the business model, which it has been said, but it's really crucial. So, and then of course, barrier to entries, all these criteria we are uh, going through them. But I would say really, go to markets uh, um, and and team, and how do you mix tech and care? Because if you are only the one or the other, you will that fits to this market, which is so specific of uh, ERs. Yeah, true. Okay, um, I'm going to split the jury in two in terms of two the two next questions here. So Ritesh, let me come back to you. Um, let me cast your mind back to your, the last eight ventures. So you've done all the triage, so you're really down to the eight that you thought were the hottest anyway when you got to 32. Um, how did your assessment evaluation change evolve, I guess, to get you from eight to, to the final one. You're muted. It was actually eight to maybe four and then the final one. Uh, uh, you know, that's sort of how I went about it. And the eight, it was difficult. You had to really, I, I had to do a little bit more research and evening was spent going through, you know, more about, you know, what is the offer really and what, what makes sense for this business? What's the market look like? Are the, you know, if uh, going through that same process, but, you know, it also came down to unique kind of offerings. So if you go from the eight to the four or the two, you know, it really started to come down to unique offerings that were there that were, were potentially the the winner uh, as we went forward because the rest of it was there now right the team yes I've made that decision the funding yes we've made that decision there is a market maybe there's a couple of competitors so as you narrow it down further you went down that market competitor what is the potential going forward rather than looking at the team and the funding and the background mm -hmm. and everything else because those decisions are already made I would say there was maybe some subliminal bias in the winner, uh, but I'll leave that till the end. <laughs> okay, yeah, no, I'll get to that as well. Um, yeah, I'll get that to that as well. Uh, Amit, how, how much did maturity uh, and potentially the maturity as defined by the Galen Growth um, uh, algorithm, which we provided the data on, how much did that influence your your decision? And the reason I ask the question is because when we do talk to startups who uh, go to pitch competitions or generally, you know, uh, enroll in these type of more uh, broader uh, uh, selection processes, many of them feel that because they lack maturity, they're not going to get selected. So that's why I'm asking the question, because what we try to do with our maturity score is to consider the venture within its own context rather than in the broader digital health pool. But I mean, I guess I just want to get your perspective as to how much maturity of the venture and what is achieved influences your your selection so look uh, i think again uh, a great benchmark uh, to look at the companies 
Um, and again, as an investor, see how much you can de-risk the company's future growth and survival. So I would put a twist to the word maturity and also uh -huh. uh, a little different approach than I think Ritesh and uh, some of the rest of the team members. So my first criteria of elimination was more on the real unmet need, um, you know, so the innovation, how many of them, I think that point, I agree with Ritesh, how many of those exist in the current universe? How do they differentiate amongst themselves? That was my first sort of elimination because, you know, it was a, a whole bunch of them. And even though they were great quality, I wanted to find out the real science part, the, you know, access, the unmet need part. And then I sort of started racking and stacking them based on team, the management team, the capabilities. Uh, and uh, to your point, well, rather than saying maturity, it was more how much were they scalable, number one. Okay. And then from an investor standpoint of view, the monetization part of it. Because a lot of these companies may have great science, great innovation, but whether they can actually be monetized as they make their offering outside. And that sort of goes hand in hand with scale and monetization at the same part. And it sort of, again, falls back a little bit to the team because you have the science part, which has been taken care of. That's why they've reached where they are right now. Uh, you also have, you know, probably good advisory board, which is telling them the right stuff to do. But then who is their go-to-market guy? Who's the guy who's going to really take that from a science-led, innovation-led to a true market leader or true market presence? And yes, they may have competitors in the market, but how do they actually differentiate themselves in the market? So now for me, that part of the investment thesis starts to play in. Look, I, I, if I want to invest in this company, can they hold up to all these points? I'm thinking about scalability, um, you know, the ability to monetize better, and also very importantly, the ability to attract great talent as they grow. Because one of the things that we have seen as these companies transform themselves to be you know, pure play, innovative platforms, going commercial and then scaling up, the human capital makes a whole lot of difference. So it's a part of the team, but not just the original team, but now the ability to attract more and more team members to actually take them to a 2.0 or a 3.0 phase. So I think those are the things that sort of help us, the market, whether this would be a company where we would put as, as an investor, where we would deploy capital. And then the one, the last thing, we as investors always love to do is we, we've got a very large universe of portfolio companies out there. Yeah. So we yeah. also see how they are synergistic with some of a portfolio company. Now I may know, mm. uh, I think this may be a one-off from our side because you know I've got 140 portfolio companies and I've always, always loved to see a fit. Now that's not a final criteria of selection, but if there is a fit, that sort of checks in one more box from my side saying, hey, this could be a very, very attractive platform for us to invest in. And that makes perfect sense. And I think increasingly so, as we see digital health maturing more towards integrated solutions and just one off bilateral deals. Um, yeah. Now, Ritesh may have alluded to this in his comment, but I couldn't help but see a correlation between having two French jury members and <laughs> two French semi finalists. So the question to, to Stefan to start with is uh, how much is geography uh, way uh, in your decision making? I will be very honest. Uh, I, I started by saying I try to be agnostic on a lot of things. <laughs> this one has been one of the criteria, and this is really honest. No, no, I didn't take into account you know, the origin. Okay, fine. And, and yes? Do we have a Joker card? <laughs> <laughs> No, but, but listen, wait, wait. what no, but what yeah. uh, what the, your question is inspiring for me is that um, you like it or not, you probably can't uh, separate uh, healthcare business and geopolitics. And I think what we've been through is a, a sanitary crisis, a COVID crisis, but the exacerbation of the American. Uh, and Chinese uh, economic war with Europe in the middle. 
And there is something that is at play here and that is really interesting. And what I see, and the reason why I'm here is that I see European industrials, European leaders that kind of wake up because they don't only feel in the middle of a sanitary crisis, they feel in the middle of an economic war. And they said, if I don't move now, if I don't accelerate, I will be stuck in the middle of US and America uh, and China. And we have a role to play as European actors. And we have um, a way to, we have to think about how, what to think about data. And I think this is really key. Do we want to overprotect our citizens so that at the end, you put innovation at risk because everything is so protected that uh, you can't do anything? Or do we want to be like China, like whatever, uh, we have a broadened view on, on data and this, can go into some political systems that are not compatible with the European uh, political point of view. And I think we are not clear at all on this data governance, what I would say data governance, and there is a lot to, uh, to be thought about and, and to be work on. And that I think this is also one of the reasons why we created Future for Care. So uh, that would be the way I would answer your question, because it's, I think it's key. Okay, no, no, thank you. And it's key because, and it's difficult because even so, your innovation can be successful only if it's global because the market is global. So how do you play, you know, in a global market with with this with this specificity and local specificity? That's a hard a question that we need to answer. It. So, Julian, I, mean, I, would, I would, if I could chime in here, I don't think Please. geography is the is is the was the criteria. Yeah. You know, because if you looked at uh, the last eight, even, you know, we had India, we had France, we had Singapore, yep, you know, true. so uh, I think it's the market thing to, you know, uh, to Agnes's point, uh, my subliminal message is that I do a lot of work for Business France here in, in New York. So <laughs> to bring and, and advise and guide, guide French startups as they try and come into the US market, right? So that was the subliminal thing, perhaps. But it wasn't the criteria at all. It really was around, is there a model here? Is the offering unique enough? Or is there a potential for this to be a global thing? They just happen to be in France or India or Singapore. Uh, but I do suggest that for particularly as I sit in the US, whoever is the winner, whatever market they're in, if they're looking at one of the largest markets on the planet for products or services that they have, that they do have to think about that. Uh, geography is, a, is, a, is an issue then. But if the product, like if you look at companies, uh, and I'll go to a tangent a little bit, touch surgery, digital surgery were based in Shoreditch, right at the roundabout, Silicon, you know, London. Uh, and they were really doing well in Europe, but then Medtronic came along and snapped them up, right? So build a market in Europe, then so, you could then be acquired by a, a Nova Holdings, <laughs> you know, out of <laughs> Singapore or a Medtronic in, in the US. Very easy to do. So I don't think geography is an issue. No, no, I just thought I'd ask simply because I saw a little correlation building along as we were moving further right towards the finalists. Um, so very quickly before we switch our attention to the winners and literally quickly in terms of answers, but so without naming names, that's not what we're aiming at. Uh, can you give us a flavor as to whether you are going to reach out or have reached out to any of the contestants you were evaluating over the past six weeks? I'll start with you, Stefan. Without naming names, yeah, the, the intention is not to name names, but more to get a sense of whether you have found some interesting uh, ventures in the 64 that you have already reached out to or you plan to. I, I had, to be honest, identified very interesting uh, ventures. So now it's much more, yes, an, a, a potential opportunity within our journey to see is that something we can uh, uh, move ahead, but to your point, yes, I think in that sense, that's that has been really interesting. Cool, thank you, Stefan. Uh, Amit. So, <laughs> in full disclosure, we've been in touch with some of them prior to the event already, um, without taking names again. Uh, and definitely, this is a very attractive and a very exciting pool. And I think we will be reaching out to them, a few of them, in fact. Uh, both, as I said, from a synergistic play of some of our existing portfolio companies, but also I think more on a standalone. As I said, that you know we we really see 
Uh, a few of them address the unmet need, the access need. Uh, and again, just to, just to add a point there from a geographical perspective, I actually uh, agree with Ritesh to an extent that the companies we are looking at today have to be global. There, there's no doubts about it, that these solutions that they're producing, if, if they're not global, it'd be very hard for them to survive. Mm -hmm. Having said that, they may have certain nuances for certain geographies, which are important. Just, just to give you an idea, uh, access is a big problem in our part of the world. So when we look at telehealth and telemedicine uh, in particular, we, we see that in geographies where there is a, a doctor-patient skew, you look at emerging markets, especially, you know, when you look at Indonesia, Vietnam, India, uh, a lot of other emerging markets, that is a that is a huge you know unmet need. So as they address these needs, whether as you know telehealth aggregators or access to these specialists or, or providing certain other things like diagnostic tests and pharma at a reasonable price point, I think those are specific needs to a geography. But overall, when we evaluate these companies, we rack and stack them to the best around the globe because. There is nothing stopping some of these global companies. They may be in the US today, but there's nothing stopping them to come to Asia or to Europe. So it has to be a boundaryless play that way. Thanks, Amit. Uh, and yes, same question. You're muted. Sorry for that. No, definitely. I mean, I, I have a list of the one <laughs> I would love to be in contact with. So, uh, no. Um, no, this jury was great. Um, quality of the initiative, again. Uh, uh, was really impressive, and um, and yes, we would love to have more time uh, to get contact with uh, almost uh, each of them. So, uh, congratulations to uh, all of uh, all of them. Absolutely, uh, not only the winner. <laughs> Ritesh, over to you. Yeah, well, there's uh, there's two actually that I've sort of reached out to more from a potential partnership with. Uh, a couple of clients here in the US that are looking at uh, that kind of thing that they want to get done. So for sure. Great. So it's, uh, yeah. it's positive news for, for many of the 64, which is great. Yeah. Okay, so let's, uh, let's switch to to announcing the winners. So just context. So we started with 64, 64 that was selected, according to certain criteria, but really just looking at data facts. So there was no, there was a very unbiased, unhyped approach to selection of 64. And then we uh, we asked the jury to uh, to start selecting and, and triaging and, and moving towards the finalists. In parallel, as I said in the beginning, we also asked uh, roughly six, sixty thousand or so followers and subscribers that Galen Growth has to to vote in what we call the Health Tech Tribal, the popular vote. So um, the winners. Um, in previous years, we started this in twenty seventeen. Uh, in previous years, Bioformi won the inaugural. Award. Uh, most of you will be familiar with Bioformi. Born in Singapore, it's now based in Boston. It has raised a fantastic amount of money since 2017 uh, and has uh, certainly been announced a part by many large uh, corporations, including Novartis. 2018 saw Halodoc win. Uh, for those of you who are very familiar with Asia Pack, you will know Halodoc and what it has achieved. Again, raised a fantastic amount of money uh, in its Series B uh, and continues to. Um, uh really solve that whole access and uh, uh and delivery of uh of medicine in in um, in markets that are developing such as for example indonesia 2019 you're one of the investors in Halodoc, as you probably may know <laughs> yeah 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 absolutely <laughs> <laughs> um uh, along with uh, uh numerous other uh well-known investors including uh gates so uh right. it, it's certainly um Jonathan's been very successful in, in attracting uh, some, some high profile investors. Uh, 2019 saw Hello Health uh, win uh, in the Southeast Asian venture. Uh, and more just towards those purposes, I would describe it as a WebMD of, um, uh, of, of Southeast Asia. And then 2020 saw Plano win uh, another Southeast Asian venture. Um, what's different this year is one, the starting point was much more global in terms of the 64. And of course, uh we had this parallel track of jury and, and popular vote so uh, due to the short notice sadly of knowing the jury's winner we were unable to uh have a member of the winner uh, the jury's winner to attend today so uh, we'll have to solve that uh, and i think and yes i can think of a little idea that uh 
that we can work on together to try and solve. However, I am your... happy to accept on their behalf all the of money <laughs> that I know well, is going to throw their way. So, you know, if you're willing to give me the check, I'm happy to do that. <laughs> um, the uh, winner of the jury vote is, is Gleamer. Uh, Gleamer is a Paris based French digital startup developing medical grade AI solutions focused developed solutions, sorry, for, for the radiologists. Uh, and therefore, of course, focused on uh, orthopedics. It was founded in 2017, uh, and we're very excited that it has won. And we're very excited that we have a European winner uh, as uh, as an outcome of, of the jury's vote. Um, and um, unfortunately, as I said, due to short notice, they're unable to find someone in a, a C-suite, the leadership team, to join us today. Uh, so um, I was thinking, and yes, that um, you be in Paris as well, we could get ourselves organized uh, in the next uh, few weeks early next year to have an official handover of the award to uh, to the Gleamer team. Um, so that, that's Gleamer. I'm and, happy you know, to do we'll, that. And to, great. Uh, we'll get oh ourselves organized. We'll, we'll invite Stefan as well, who's uh, sure. uh, works near that area. Um, so that, that's the jury vote. So congratulations to Gleamer, the Gleamer team. Uh, we will obviously communicate this officially to them. Um, uh, but uh, of course, they know in, a, in an unofficial way when we were trying to reach them uh, yesterday when we had the final result from, from your vote. Uh, and we will, of course, uh, uh, arrange for an official uh, handover of the award. The popular vote, though, uh, or Health Tech Tribe vote, uh, is with us today. Uh, and it gives me great pleasure to invite um, Peter uh, Macar Moulin, who is the founder of uh, Yes Mum, to join us. I've seen him join. Hopefully, he can switch his video on and join us. Yay! You're still mute. That's it. Congratulations, Hi. Peter, Thank for you. being the winner of the popular vote for the 2021 Galen Growth Most Promising Digital Health Startup. Uh, as you know, it was a hard fought, hard fought battle, 64 ventures from across the world. And as the jury have been telling us for the last uh, 45 minutes, you know, a, a really a hotbed of innovation and very attractive ventures. So congratulations, take great pride in having won. But let me hand back to you to tell us a bit more about Yes Mum. Where have you come from? Uh, what are you trying to solve, I guess? And, and, and where are you going? Yeah, so uh, Yes Mom is making uh, laboratory uh, diagnostic tests more accessible um, by uh, shipping out uh, self-collection kits that use a few drops of capillary blood uh, for uh, about 30 different panels, uh, sorry, different, 30 different analytes. Um, and what we do is on top of that is interpret those digital, uh, so those, those uh, biomarkers with digital results. Uh, so more than just uh, relaying the, the lab results, uh, we interpret um, what those actually mean for uh, for individuals' uh, healthcare goals. So we, we began uh, as a fertility company, uh, and, and currently our, our flagship product is a fertility test that looks at uh, eight uh, different fertility hormones uh, and interprets those results for everything from menopause timeline, uh, egg freezing, uh, viability, uh, polycystic ovary syndrome, which is uh, a cause for about 40% of uh, infertility uh, in women. Uh, but today we're, we're, we're launching uh, about 10 more uh, panels. Uh, so looking at NCDs like uh, heart health, diabetes, uh, food sensitivity as well. Um, and uh, we, we will be changing, uh, we will be launching a new brand as well, along with those, uh, those uh, broader uh, test panels that we have in, in the coming year. So. Uh, this is really fantastic uh, to, to, to receive this, uh, this award. And I want to thank everyone in the health tech uh, ecosystem and our, and our partners um, and supporters who've been enthusiastically voting for us uh, at, each, uh, at each round. Uh, and I'm tremendously grateful to, to Galen Growth um, for shining a spotlight on, uh, on, on health tech uh, startups like us. We, we really need it and appreciate it. Um, I mean, this, this win is a is a testimony to the hard work and dedication uh, of our team uh, and, and the progress we've made in, in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, but I think it's also a testimony to the, the opportunity for, for what we're doing. Um, and I think the opportunity for health uh, tech companies uh, more broadly uh, in Southeast Asia uh, and, and in Thailand, where we're currently based. Um, so again, thank, thank you very much. Congratulations, Peter, once again. 
um, you, in addition to a, a lovely uh, trophy that uh, will be um, sent to you, I guess is probably the best way to, to, to deal with this one in relation of your geographic movements. I think we catch you in the US today, is that right? Sorry? We, we catch you in the US today, is that right? Yeah, I'm in the, I'm in, uh, the East Coast, I'm in Boston. Uh, yeah, so we'll have to get, get the trophy to you, uh, I guess, as you return back to Thailand. Um, but in addition to that, um, there are, uh, there's a monetary value to this. Uh, so it's a big thank you to Amazon Web Services for their uh, contribution and uh, the details of, of what you've won uh, will be uh, communicated to you by the team. I know Melvin will send you an email. Uh, as well as uh, a um, uh, access to uh, Help Take Alpha uh, subscription for the year, uh, allowing you to obviously do some more market entry planning, identifying suitable investors, etc. And again, Melvin will communicate that information to you. So, so there is certainly a, a value to to winning in addition to uh, the beautiful trophy, in addition to, of course, getting some uh, some 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 presents. So, big well done and. Um, Looking forward to uh, seeing a picture of you and your team with the trophy when you receive it. Um, just wanted to close off to say a big, big thank you to my jury for your time today. Um, it's nice to hear how you looked at uh, the 64 contestants, the high quality contestants that uh, we put in front of you. Uh, very excited obviously to have arrived at a, at a winner uh, from your own voting uh, process. Uh, and uh, looking forward to um you know working with you in 22 as we continue to move the needle uh, of digital health and really scale digital health in your respective geographies um so thank you very much for your time and thank you very much to all the other jury members who are not on this panel but of course gave their time to arrive at a winner and again peter congratulations yep congratulations yeah. congratulations peter well done thank you Agnes. thank you well thanks everyone have okay. a great happy thanksgiving happy, happy thanksgiving, thanksgiving. Happy thanksgiving. Yeah. Happy thanksgiving. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank you. bye bye, bye.